smooth if you can hear me that is technology uh i've got a guitar in my lap so god help us um i want to thank everybody for being here uh five watt live this today is uh, brought to you with the support of the friends of five watt on patreon my patreon support group uh more about those good folks later in the middle of the stream uh, i want to welcome everybody for being here uh today we're going to talk about les pauls and no this is not a les paul we're going to talk about that um and we're gonna talk about the reasoning I used to buy this Collings instead of a Gibson at this point in time. Um, it's not a Collings ad, it's not a Gibson bashing session. They're both wonderful guitars. I'm just sharing how I settled on this choice. I got a lot of notes over here, obviously. Uh, I see a lot of folks that I recognize in the stream. Is that just a chat or something going to be presented? <laughs> I'm gonna talk probably too long. Uh, let me see who was that, who had asked that question. James. Well, you know, James, you'll have to judge for yourself. It's going to be a chat and I don't do just straight Q and A's very often. Okay. Maybe never. Um, but I am going to try to ask que answer questions as they hit. Um, and, um, yeah, and I'll, I'll put them in here. Uh, it's nice to see Perry, my, my editor. I haven't been able to work on strips with Perry. We've both been crazy busy. Um, and, uh, it's great to see folks here. Um, <laughs> Otto von Fledermaus has got dibs on this guitar. Everybody heard that. Okay. Uh, BB Ninja is here. BB Ninja, the moderator to the stars and to us. And uh, watch for his answers in the chat. They are always on spot. And uh, sometimes he even saves me. Okay. Okay. He always saves me. If he, if he feels a need to answer, it's usually because he's got it right. Um, music in the intro today was taken from a clip of Ariel Posen did for Carter Vintage. That was a 53 Les Paul with the original P90 pickups, of course. So I thought it was fitting for today's topic since I am going to cover why P90s and why not humbuckers for me. Um, I always encourage the group hang. I mean, I, I talk a lot about 5 Watt World as a world that I did it on purpose. Um, can you turn down, turn up my volume? Uh, I can. And actually, I can probably move the mic a little closer there. I didn't want it to be too crazy loud when I actually strum a chord with the guitar. You'll have to give me a mic check back. Is that better? There we go. All right, probably. It's hanging right over my head now. It's right there. Uh, Jeff's here. I saw Jeff. Uh, Undercover Steve. How many hats have sold? Steve, I don't know. Steve is uh, really gunning because he, he encouraged me to get the hats. Um, so um, we're going to remember to put it at 5 Watt World if you want me to um, talk about what you've got going on. Uh, in the stream. Otherwise, I'm going to assume you're talking among yourselves. Like I said, I encourage that. This is a hang. There's a lot of the same people here um, every time we do one of these. And I think that's great. I, I love the, I, I saw a definition recently that a community is something where people also communicate with each other. And I think that's really important. This is not just an audience thing. God help us if that's if we're all just here to listen to me yammer on. Um, uh, let's see. So uh, if you got to remember, if you got a question, put it at five what world, um, it makes it pop up in my chat as bolded. Uh, actually, you know what, I'm going to pull out the that works actually better over here in 
uh, YouTube land. I'm going to pop that out, pop the chat out, pull that over here, and that comes up better over there. There we go. K Major, hey man. Christopher Butler. Phil Mance is giving me a five by five. Thanks, Phil. Okay, now back to the predetermined comments. Um, why this topic now? I'm actually finishing a script called The Less Pauls That Changed the World, um, where I you know, spent the time outlining and scrambling, trying to come up with the 10 players and guitars that made the biggest difference to music over time. Uh, I actually, I actually very naively set out to do this as five, you know, because it's five wet world. <laughs> what a fool. Uh, 10 is brutal. It's going to be 10 plus at least five honorable mentions. Um, I actually had a good meeting with uh, with Jeff earlier today and Rob. And maybe if we if if I completely run out of stuff to say, uh, a rarity, um, but it could happen. We might go to the list and argue that out because I haven't finalized the script. I'm going to finalize the script tomorrow morning and then film probably tomorrow afternoon or, or Monday morning. Um, so this is, I'm, I'm neck deep in famous Les Paul players. And so I... I was in here working on the script and I was looking at famous pictures of guys and reading their histories and researching and books and stuff. And then I was going to the living room and I was picking up this and Jeff had it the other day. And actually Jeff was here on Monday. First time we'd ever been in the room together. There was a picture on Instagram. If you don't follow on Instagram, I, I don't want to get anybody addicted as I am to Instagram. So don't go there if you're not there already, but if you are there, go, there's a picture of Jeff and I, and Jeff was playing and he picked up the guitars in order and he picked up this one first. And he was like, wow, Colin, they're really nice guitars. And then he looked at me and he smirked and he goes, it's not a Les Paul, <laughs> which you can't argue that fact. It's not a Les Paul. Um, the thumbnail obviously is this guitar. Uh, that photograph was taken and I need to thank the guys at Legit Music. Rob at Legit Music is amazing. Um, again, not a paid ad, just a great experience I had. Um, real briefly, the history of this guitar, I think I touched on it a couple streams ago. Um, this guitar was a custom order. Uh, it's a CL City Limits Deluxe, Cowling City Limits Deluxe. I'm going to go through some of the specs that made me go this way instead of Custom Shop again. I had a, an R9 in 2021. Um, and um, somebody ordered this and Collings almost got the guitar done and there was a mistake in the finish and they destroyed the guitar and started over. It's the kind of crazy people they are at Collings. And uh, the guy didn't want to wait anymore, so he, he bought something else. And then when this guitar did come in, a collector bought it and put it in a closet and then played it, not at all, and then came in and traded it on something else. Uh, thank you, whoever that is. I appreciate it. If they ever show up here and, and know that and they recognize this and wish they bought it for this top, et cetera, I appreciate it. It's not quite as orange. Maybe it is. It looks a little more amber in person than it does in that shot. I mean, in, in the in the natural light on the camera. Um, so uh, I don't want to miss stuff in the chat. Dan Bailey's here. Dave Misham wants us to know uh, that he's got P90s, really likes it. Yeah. Um, you know, and of course, Rick Beato, my good friend Rick, just launched his second version of his signature in Sparkling Burgundy this week. And um, and that's in um, that's a P90 guitar as well. Uh, and I've spent a lot of time. I'm going to be doing an episode on P90s um, and the history of P90s. Um, so, all right. So, uh, is that sounds good to everybody? destroyed uh destroyed wow what a waste it you know it could be that it went to an artist <laughs> i know that some guitar companies do that that uh when they're like yeah it's not good enough to go to the customer oh we'll give it to a guitar player you know somebody like keith or jeff actually they didn't give me any guitars um i'm not that good a guitar player as we'll demonstrate later in the stream perhaps i'll play this a little bit um that feels right they are bell like it's really something I'm going to talk about it. So I'm going to talk about uh, Collings. I'm going to talk about Gibsons and I'm going to talk about my experience and how I ended up here. Again, I'm not here to bash anybody. I, I have, <laughs> Jeff says needs a Kaler. Well, he would know he played it. Um, and actually that's a Neil Schoen thing. That's in the video. Anyway, we're going to touch on that in the video. So um, before we do the, the, the shtick about this though, I want to say somebody said in the comments, and it's not there now, but it was earlier, maybe they removed it, that they're sick of the clickbait titles and they expect that from younger guys, but not us old guys. So if I skip over the old guy comment, um, I think what they were referring to was the why not a Les Paul. Um, 
And uh, let me define clickbait for you. Because as a YouTuber and a person that tries to go on the positive side of things, this is important to me. Um, I think of a clickbait title as a title that gets you to click on it and then doesn't deliver, doesn't answer the question. Um, the challenge for all of us on YouTube is to have titles that start a conversation. That's how I describe a title of a video. Um, and since Les Paul is certainly the big, uh, the 800 pound gorilla in the room of a Collings versus Les Gibson, Les Paul conversation, it makes sense to sort of posit the question in relation to the Gibson that I didn't buy instead of this one. So you can judge by the, from here to the end whether or not I answer the question, but I would argue that I disagree with, I um, respectfully disagree with the comment that that, that was a clickbait title. Um, so I, I think that's, I think that makes sense. I hope that's cool with folks. I hope that makes sense. Um, I've, I've always joked for a long time. And every time I mentioned it to Rick Beato, he says, he's going to make the video. If I don't, I'm going to make a video called the first, um, the five things I hate about five things I hate videos, because I really dislike negative titles. They, it's almost like everything in the media, they figured out that if they can scare us, they can get us to watch. And in particular, um, my mom watches a lot of weather. Um, She's 86 years old, so the weather's important, you know, whether she's driving or walking outside to feed the birds or whatever. So um, it seems like now it's all 50% chance of rain instead of 50% chance of sun. Like, I don't know when that happened, uh, but it makes me feel old and I don't appreciate it. Anyway, all right. So um, the first reason I went this direction is um, ergonomics. And I've talked about this. You guys have seen me play Strandbergs. I don't have one out in here right now because I'm set up for the stream. Um, actually, you know what? Um, before I do that, let me, now I, I I'm going to show you my, I'll show you my signal path because it's important. Um, but the first one is ergonomics. So if I flip this over, well, the first part is that I can just kind of mount it around like this. This is a, um, this guitar was eight pounds and two ounces. All right. So, um, most custom shop Les Paul. So the one I had was particularly light. It came from Mark's guitar loft in New Hampshire and Mark had you know kept an eye out for me and he found one used that was just around eight pounds great cool guitar um but it didn't have these other features uh, anyway this one weighs eight pounds two ounces and i was willing to pay for the extra two ounces for the top i think you'd all appreciate that um but if i flip this uh, i gotta set up so you can see the can so i can see the camera here you can see that there if i get the light just right ah there we go there's a belly cut on the top and on the bottom, there's actually a, a leg cut. And actually I'm, I'm kind of torn about the leg cut. I think a straight edge would be comfortable, but I trust Bill Collings who's gone now, God rest his soul. But the fact is uh, that he designed this into like the very earliest electrics. Uh, and I have to tell you that sitting with this is, I actually had my Telecaster, I have a, a JV Telecaster that I got to do the Japan short history, um, Fender Japan short history. And this, you know, to say that this is more comfortable to play than a telly for me, because of that belly cut and stuff sitting down, I mostly play sitting down. I'm not a rock and roll guy at this point. Um, crazy comfortable. Uh, this is, this guitar is really, really comfortable. So that's the first thing I would say. So the weight and then those cutaways, um, those custom shop Les Pauls often run. I, I often go like on Wildwood or someplace and get, try to get a sense of what's, what's on the shelf or at Anderton's places where they list the weight of guitars and see what they are. And they regularly run nine pounds. Um, I, we were talking earlier about whether or not Al Demiola should be on the list and the black um, standard that he had, or was it a custom? Jeff, was it a custom? Anyway, that he had with DeMarzio's in it. Um, he joked that it weighed, that he was selling it. He was letting it go. It's the guitar that was on the Return to Forever record and Casino and Elegant Gypsy. And um, he joked that it weighed 300 pounds. Um, and that was a 60, it's in my custom video. I think it's a 74. So it was a, a Norlin era, um, new guitar when he bought it. So that's a big difference, whether it's on a strap or even just sitting in your lap. I, I've owned guitars that are over nine pounds and sometimes they sound great, sometimes less so. You hear a lot of people debating whether or not a light guitar is the way to go because of resonance. I think it actually is the specific qualities of the wood, um, which is a good um, sort of, uh, segue. So if you can see the grain in this back wood, oh yeah, you can easily. So it's beautiful. It is a two piece back. It's about two thirds, one third. The, the line is here. 
That's right about there. Um, this is a Honduran mahogany back and neck. And Honduran was the wood that they used in the 50s. Now, obviously, it's not that level of wood because a lot of the forests have been cut and the really big trees were cut like Brazilian rosewood. There quite literally isn't Brazilian rosewood of the quality that there was in the 50s. So much of the forest has been cut. But that's really a price point that Collings is willing to spend that the custom shop at Gibson doesn't seem to be willing to do. And that's the reason this guitar weighs what it does. Um, it's also not weight relieved. It's obviously long 10 and all the original stuff that made these great. It has the original scale, very, very close to a 59 scale um, at uh, 24 and 7 eighths, which is so close to the 24.694, et cetera, whatever it was, uh, that the because they used to measure the scale in a slightly different way in the 50s. Um, Uh, yeah, uh, Dave Meacham is reminding me that Sweetwater also shows weights. It's actually an interesting thing to go periodically and kind of see what things are running. I actually was looking around for a strat. I'm thinking of doing a course called um, Great Tone at Home about how to set up at home and different stuff. And it seems like I should have a strat to play, you know, as demos for those things. In that course, I couldn't come up with a strat that was closer to seven pounds that wasn't made out of basswood. Um, everything was eight pounds and a bunch of guitars, even custom shop guitars were eight pounds and 10 ounces um, in strats. So I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what the current state of wood is and kind of where that's going to leave us. Uh, but it's pretty interesting. Um, if you've got a particularly less Paul, now would be the time to flex it in the chat. <laughs> because uh, I do run into people who actually, you know, have one that weighs seven pounds and six ounces or something periodically. And uh, Jeff actually just ran into a I think it was a Murphy lab that came in and a shop. I'm not going to mention it because since Jeff might still want it, well, he might want, he wants it. That's not a question. Uh, he probably doesn't need it. Um, but they do, they do come through. Uh, it happens. Um, Scott Brockway says eight pounds, eight pounds is fine. 10 pounds is not. There's a good video actually where Tim Pierce and Rhett Scholl, uh, both people I, I know, um, go shopping for uh, Les Paul for, for Rhett. And that's pretty interesting because they're looking at everything, Murphy Labs to, you know, old custom shops. And I think he ended up buying a 1997 custom shop, pretty early custom shop guitar, um, which is interesting. And they're all different weights. Like they guess, it's interesting. They guess the weight and then they put it on the scale. And it's interesting to see how close they get it or not get it. Mike Krutz. Hey, Mike, I told the guys at Alien Nation, hi for you, Mike. Uh, time to mention that his custom shop, Les Paul, that's seven pounds even. Wow. We got to talk. <laughs> I need pictures. Um, the other thing about these guitars is that um, all of the components are absolutely the best things in the business. Um, they have Collings um, branded. I think these are Gotos. Um, they make their own tuner buttons in-house. They make these on their own machine. They buy this ivoroid. It's plastic ivory looking. It even has grain. I don't think I could show that probably on the camera. Um, this is ivoroid. These are all individually. These are obviously lathed or something injection. No, I think they're billeted out of a piece of billet um, at Collings. Um, there was a big debate whether I should put this cover or one that was closer to this color. Everybody voted for this. I have gone to the taken the world's uh, opinion at this point. Um, so, um, and then the pickups you get with these are either Lawlers or throwbacks. I, I, you know, I don't mean to say that all back, all off market aftermarket pickups are better than the things that you do get from custom though. When I bought my custom shop, everybody immediately wanted to know, um, what pickups I was going to put in it, which made me laugh because I had just spent six grand on the guitar. Um, so, so Woods, th those are the overall things. Um, um, I don't want to do an hour on this, but I also have a interesting sort of, um, I don't have the relationship with Gibson that say Rick does. I'm just not big enough. I'm just not a big enough person in the YouTube universe. Um, and I like to work with companies where they're small enough to get them on the phone. Um, when I was negotiating to buy this from Legit Music, there was no pick guard and I wanted a pick guard, but they don't send one unless it's ordered that way. And, um, Robert Lidget reached out to Collings and Collings immediately said that they would make me a pick guard for this guitar with the P90 routes, um, no charge. There was never a conversation about charging me for it. And it's not because I was a YouTuber. My impression was that that like the guitar, they were gonna follow the guitar through its life. Um, I don't think Mark Altons, the guy Altons, 
uh, the guy at uh, Collins even knew that I was on YouTube until I connected with him later. Um, so I think that level of attention, I love companies that are still out there listening to musicians. I love that they're doing a guitar, that they did a signature, a couple of different signature guitars for uh, Julian Lodge. Um, I just really think that they're, um, they're doing what the companies did at the beginning. Um, so, all right. So um, I actually have a whole section here on how much they cost. So you guys let me know if you want to. I did some research on that. We'll, we'll double back. Um, so uh, questions about that? Other really light guitars? I don't want to, I want to get these as we go by. Uh, Dave says he's got an Aerodyne made in Japan Strat from, it's around nine pounds. I remember those Aerodyne guitars were heavy and I don't know why. Um, they were bound. They had the standard kind of routes and stuff. I don't know why they'd be so expensive. Uh, Randall Vandergriff. My Italia single cut with fiber, fiberglass finish over the wood is heavy. I'll bet it is. I'll bet that's heavy. Uh, what did I Chris, that miss questions here? Oh, right. Perry has uh, a really beautiful, a special, a very special um, custom shop, Les Paul. And it's, he said it's in the eight pound range. Uh, that's great. I didn't, I thought, Perry, I thought your Les Paul was heavier, but maybe that's, Perry's a Strat guy. Um, so, um, oh, I guess, I guess now would be the time to play a little bit. So, um, that's the overall reason to get this guitar. I'm going to talk about P90s. And honestly, if y'all closed your eyes, I'm not sure you could tell me if it was a humbucking guitar or P90s. I'm far enough from the amp. You're not, there's hum from that amp, even though it's, um, I'm going to show you the stack. So where we're going from the guitar, we're going into, um, that little pedal board. Uh, if I take, didn't make it bigger. Um, this is a prototype. It's going into a prototype David Barber pedal that I'm developing with David um, that I'll talk about in a future stream. We just got the proofs back on the case. David's graphics style did a great job. It's totally in the most music from the least gear in that it'll do two very different tones. Um, I guess I have to tell you what it does. it does. So the two things it does, it does a blues breaker, JTM 45 on one side of the switch. And if you throw it on the other side of the switch, it does a, um, a dumble, but on a lower gain setting than a lot of dumble pedals do, um, because I basically think that everybody is over gaining their dumble sounds. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of harmonic switches and stuff too. Um, so, um, you know, I'm doing that list and people forget that Les Paul's, you know, started life as jazz guitars. Um, <laughs> Was on testing with John Cordy earlier today. Oh, I didn't finish the, the uh, boy, I'm all over the place. That's the rest of the rig. It's going into a, I'm joking that it's a catalyst stack. It's just one catalyst sitting on the other one to get it closer to the mic. Um, but it's a catalyst 60 in the room, which is one of it's just the amp that I use here um, for like writing and stuff. Um, um, Les Paul's, you know, Les Paul was a jazz guy, a jazzy pop guy. I mean, this is in 19, the late, you know, forties, early fifties. It was a pop and jazz world. This is not Les Paul's music, but. I was on with John Cordy earlier and John was saying that it was the first time he'd ever heard me play guitar. <laughs> I told him he doesn't go to live streams enough.
July, boys and girls. That's about as risky as I can get around the uh, copyright, though I don't think I begin to play Pat Metheny well enough to uh, come up with a, uh, a, uh, a copyright strike. Otto guessed correctly travels because I played it for him on a live phone call yesterday, probably. Um, anyway, so um, that's, that's, you know, I, I like P90s because they are someplace a step towards a single coily kind of sound. The amp is dialed for this. The tone is wide open. Um, and I like the tone of that. I'll remind everybody that humbucking pickups were designed to sound like P90s, not the other way around. Um, the humbucking pickup existed for about 10 years as the main highest end pickup that could be, um, oh, baby's reminding us it goes back into the 30s. Uh, first pickup on the ES-150. Wasn't the first pickup on the ES-150 the Charlie Christian style pickup, uh, Bebe? And then they moved to this later, 47? Isn't that right? Anyway, um, yeah, they're not humbucking, but the humming that you're hearing is not the guitar. It's the amp. Um, that's a hum built into the model, I think. I just haven't gone in to turn it off. Um, I'm trying to catch things. Staple pickups were uh, 54, 54. It's in my, it's in my video on um, the L5 because they went to those guitars first. Picking the cowboy chords sounds kind of banjo-like without verb. This is probably um, a limitation of what you're dealing with. It's live uh, to the thing here. I'm keeping an eye on the chat because I wanted to. Oh, uh, Phil Manson says, what did I say the back and neck material are? They're mahogany, same as a regular Les Paul. Um, they're Honduran mahogany. Um, so that's what that is. David Chase Lopes, bonsoir. David is in Paris and we're not. Uh, can we see the headstock? Yes. Um, and the binding. On the neck and the headstock is ivoroid, the same as on the um, on the buttons. Phil Manson says he installed Tom Holmes PAS potted in his 97 standard, almost as jazzy as the Telfero. I'm not surprised. And of course, Tom Holmes, I don't think is, is winding anymore, but those were sort of the ultimate holy grail uh, pickups. Randall Vandergriff, I got a court sunset with TV Jones pickups and the nicest SG case I've owned retro looking thoughts on court guitars. Um, it's kind of a non sequitur, but the fact is that court is building all of the, I think court is building all some of the best, maybe most of the best um, um, course guitars coming from overseas. They're building the Strandberg guitars. They're building um, the PRS SE guitars. Um, they're building the Sire guitars. They're all um, part of that same factory. Uh, in Indonesia. Uh, they have separate factories within a factory. So each company has very specific control. They have their own crew, all that kind of stuff. It's really fascinating. Um, Bebe says, could argue that the custom shop was the first iteration. Oh, the Charlie Christian was the first iteration of a P90. That first one weighed two pounds on its own, right? Those early pickups were really heavy. Um, <laughs> Travis Niles says, uh, top chat. Thanks, Travis. Before I read your comments, since it leads with, I hate to be, love to be a hater, but something about a Les Paul just does it. Can't stand the inconsistency, but when it all lines up, it's speechless. Well, like I said, that's why we're doing that this week. I was spending the whole uh, week and a half here writing a script and listening to people play. And like, I'd never learned to play Black Dog. So I'm like muddling my way through that. 
And uh, I said that to Rick. Rick called me the other day and he's like, uh, what are you doing? So I'm pl- sitting here trying to play Black Dog. He's like, yeah, it's about time. <laughs> you you should have learned that when we were both in high school. I'm like, ah, I was doing something else. Anyway. Um, so, uh, but he says, can't stand the inconsistency. Yeah, I, I agree. I, you know, the, the less, the less Paul is a less Paul. It's what, it's what, um, Jeff said the other day, there's no way around it. And I'm sure kind of like telecasters, I'm sure there's something about the lack of ergonomics that makes people play them differently. Um, I think that probably, um, what is Bonamassa is always saying that, you know, you, you need, he needs something to fight him a little bit. Um, Les Paul was the perfect choice. And let's remember that Bonamassa was a Strat guy from the time he was a little kid until he really started making records with Kevin Shirley. And then he he kind of found his own voice um, after sounding like Stevie Ray and all these other people for a while. Uh, Bebe says, Keith's first modern, Keith, first modern P90 was in 1940. The P13 was fitted to an ES100, ES125, and ES150. Well, as I've always said, I can count on Bebe, and I'm yammering here, and um, that's probably stuff he just knows. Um, if not, he can Google it quickly, but it's the kind of stuff he knows. <laughs> Travis says, let's be honest, the smell is intoxicating. Are you talking about nitro? This is nitro. Um, I don't keep it in the case. I'm actually, this. These are all three of these colleagues are sitting in the living room uh, right now, so... Uh, yeah, BB made is there. He's a P90 rule. How you doing? All right. So let me, uh, it's, it, we're halfway through already. See, I told you it would be more mumbling than, uh, than chatting. Um, I want to remind everybody that today's five watt live is brought to you by the friends of five watt, my support community on Patreon. Uh, there's three levels of membership at friends of five watt, $5, $10 and $50 a month. You probably realize that I read all the comments on the videos and I answer all my own email. I, I always chuckle to myself when people say, you know, I really appreciate you and everybody in your team. They're not here. I would say people on my team include Bebe and people like Perry, Jeff, um, John Cordy, everybody I can wrangle into working with me on a video. Um, but they're not here. So when I read those, I'm usually sitting here in this. This is the smallest bedroom in my ranch house in upstate New York. And that's where I do the lives. It's not where I film the actual videos. They're downstairs. But um, I was they're, they're like, thanks to you and your team. And I go because they're out there in the world. They're out with you. Um, but I do read everything and I really enjoy getting comments. And I, one of the things uh, I like about Instagram, actually one of the few things I like about Instagram is that it's easy for people to reach me there. Uh, that's really important. Um, baby, very on cue, put um, put the, the link for Patreon right there. Um, I've told this story before. I started my I started the channel when I was living up in New Hampshire. Uh, I had moved away from all my good guitar playing friends uh, back in uh, Burlington, Vermont, where I had this sort of Americana band with my buddy Kevin Boyer, who I connected with again the other day, and um, Ashley Wheeler on vocals and uh, different people on bass and drums. It was it was great. Um, we didn't gig, but we just never got that far. We just had a great time playing music all week. I left that all behind. I moved to New Hampshire. Um, so creating a community online was part of why I did the channel originally. And especially anybody who started a YouTube channel knows that at the beginning, you got to have a whole host of reasons to do it because God knows you're not making money. Um, so I sort of started it this way. And at this point, you know, I, I kind of shake my head that there's over 400,000 views a month. I've done 24 million views, I think, on the channel now. Uh, I started in earnest in 2018. So it's been a while that I've been doing this. Not quite as long as my friend Rick. Um, I think we just broke 230,000 subscribers. Um, and um, and then Instagram's about f- just under 15,000. And then there's about three or f- three to 500 people that are, seem like they're always here. And there's always a number of people that are like, I made it for the first time. I love this. I love the interaction. I really do wish that when I clicked on your comment, um, I could, uh, I could, let me do, let's bring one up here. I wish when I could do this, I could conference you in. Although I don't know if I want to risk that <laughs> making you guys live, but I, I would, I would really enjoy that. Um, so um, that's one of the things that makes the Friends of Watt really important to me. Uh, at the $50 a month level, somebody wrote me after the last stream and asked if they were group hangs. And I've only done a couple of live streams for the Friends because frankly, they were so poorly attended. It doesn't seem to be what the 
friends group wanted a year ago. Um, if the friends are, that are here want to see that more, again, that's something I would really enjoy doing. I really enjoy getting notes when videos come out or in between ideas for videos from the people that are in Friends of Five Watt. It's really important to me and I really enjoy that part of it. So if you can afford it, um, you know, there's there's lots of ways to support the channel. You can buy t-shirts and you do. You guys buy a lot of great t-shirts and the new Steve Truglio's got us got hats now because he wanted one. Um, somebody asked me for a zip front um, hoodie. I'm going to put one of those together and put it up on the store. Um, but Friends of Five Watt is the best way in that it, we communicate um, directly and you can reach me. Like I said, you can always reach me on all different ways. All right. So that's the shtick. Thanks for suffering through that. Uh, Frank Glad says, I got a Gibson USA Greenie in June. There's a loan. There's a tone, not a loan, with that in the neck pickup that's Dwayne Allman at the Fillmore album and Robin Ford's song, Lateral Climb, a hollow ringing sustain. I've heard those are really great. John Cordy had one for a while and he wasn't thrilled with the fit and finish, but I think they were trying to mimic, you know, what a finish ends up being after, you know, living through some pretty heavy use. Um, Greeny was in pretty clean shape, but when Gary Moore got it, um, and then Gary put a lot of the wear on that guitar. Um, and, but John said the same thing. It was a little heavy. The one he had was a little heavy, but he thought it sounded great. I thought it played well. And he thought the pickups were really good. And he's got, I was actually talking to him today about what kinds of, um, Les Paul guitars and the guy at K-Line who John plays his tellies and strats and jazz masters. The guy at K-Line actually is building a Les Paul style guitar. Let's call it a single cut style guitar so that the guys at Gibson don't immediately send them a cease and desist letter. Um, <laughs> Perry says the neck also happened to snap while Gary owned it. A real shame. I think the neck was broken a couple of times. <coughs> so. Okay, let me go back. I thought this was really interesting. So let me go back before I talk P90 history a little bit and talk about how much they cost because this was really interesting. I went and dug again because I make these videos, you know, like a, two years ago, three years ago. Um, and I, I put in them often the price of the original one. And I'll remind everybody here, if you don't remember, because it's good for me to remind myself, when guitars were launched by Gibson in the 30s, 40s, 50s, the original offering price, the first year they came out, is the model number. I'll let that sink in. So a Gibson ES150 was $150 when it came out. Whether I don't remember what year that was. Bebe might know. Excuse me. Um, and an ES335, when it came out in 1958, was $335. When the original Gold Top Les Paul came out in 1952, it was $210. Plus, I think they charged $40 for the case. And if you think of it as a percentage of the total cost of the guitar, that's a huge percentage of the guitar. It'd be like, you know, buying a $4,000, you know, uh, used custom shop, but then you had to spend a grand to get the case. It's kind of insane, the numbers. But they were, you know, cases weren't manufactured in the same way they are now. Lifton was literally building cases from scratch. There's this whole long story about the Flying V and how the design got modified so it would fit in a standardized Lifton case and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, they were $210 in 1952. Um, you know, but most of the reproductions of Les Pauls today are really pointed at the golden burst years. So 57, 50, 58, 59, 60. Um, and so in November, I went and I found a November price list um, for Gibson and uh, and a, case, a guitar and a case in 1959 for a standard, the Burst, um, was $305. So in 2023 dollars, that would be the equivalent to $3,200. And the interesting thing to me was um, that that's not what this cost. That's not what my custom shop, Les Paul, cost. And I, I, I did this earlier today. So I spent some time kind of fretting about it. Um, and the, the, I think the thing I came to was at that time in the world, all guitars had the level of hand finishing that this guitar has. Um, that's why all the necks are slightly different. It's why all the pickups are slightly different. It's why the amps from that period are all a little bit different. Um, they just didn't have sort of the CNC manufacturing that they can knock out now. And I don't know how, what percentage of a custom shop, Les Paul, is uh, hand-finished. But if you go to videos on Collings, um, 
and maybe they're the same thing for custom shop Les Pauls, and I haven't seen it. Um, you can see how much hand finishing there is in this guitar. And so you're talking about something that costs almost double what the equivalent cost of in 1959 Les Paul would have been in 1959. Um, the other interesting thing that this guy did, which I thought this was fascinating, was he actually listed the average income in 1959 in the United States, and he calculated the price of the Les Paul as a percentage of the average median, I think, American income at the time, gross average gross income for the year. It would have been 6% of someone's salary. 6%. So if you think about what 6% of your salary is, that, you know, they always tell you, how much house can you afford? This is sort of like how much, if you use the 1959 as the benchmark, this would be how much guitar can you afford? <laughs> Um, and back in the old days, it would have been 6%. In 2018, when the guy did this on Reddit, uh, he said that the average gross income and the price of a custom shop Les Paul at the time would have come out to be about 5.7. So really very similar, very similar numbers. So if you're trying to find a budget number, um, I, and I can say, I don't think this would get very far with your partner, uh, male, female, doesn't matter. I, I, don't, I, don't, I think it probably has to do with um, that argument for percentage could go either way. That's all I'm saying. I, I don't. I'm all about um, great communication. And I really dislike comments where people imply that they're sneaking guitars past their wives and all that kind of nonsense. Um, I get the joke. Um, I, I, I've never been in a situation to do that. I'm also not currently married. So maybe there's a relation, there's a relationship to that. Uh, anyway, <laughs> anyway. Um, anyway, so I think it's interesting. Uh, it's hard to get to that level of hand finishing that we have now on something like this. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, uh, I got some comments here. Andrew says, I know it's in the short list, short history. It's in the short history, but there was a specific reasoning behind the mahogany back maple top body construction originally. Oh, was there a the reason? Oh, the original reason was um, they thought that the maple cap would give it um, the snap that it does. Um, they knew enough about guitar construction. They were building... You got to remember, Gibson was an archtop guitar company, and um, they built this guitar this way. Um, remember, they're going up. This is 1952. The Telecaster had come out in 1950. And it's interesting because they saw it as an absolute threat. But the reality was that um, we know from the little bit that we know from Fender numbers that uh, they didn't sell that well right out of the box. Um, but Gibson was right there and they wanted a piece of that action. They knew that. Fender was not tooled in order to be able to do an arch top. And so part of the arch top was frankly, just trying to be competitive. Um, we know that using a rosewood fingerboard was recommended um, to Fender later on because it was seen as a, pre a premium feature on the Gibson guys and the Gibson guitars and the people in marketing for Fender uh, were having to sort of explain why that wasn't the case. Uh, Kate, Kate Major wants to know if this is 50s wiring. It is. Yep. These come from the factory as 50s wiring. Um, and these are Lawler P90s. They're standard P90s. Um, I have actually talked to um, Ron Ellis about having a set of his P90s to try. I've also thought about trying a set of John Gundry's P90s. John is probably of the custom pickup builders I've talked to the nerdiest <laughs> P90 guy I've ever talked to. And he has, I think, four or five different styles of P90s. And Lawler has, actually, I saw just, I just saw an ad on Instagram. It's scary what they know about me. Um, they put, sent me a Lawler ad where um, Jason Lawler and company was showing how many of their pickups will go into this route, how many different styles of pickups they have that will go into this route. Um, I actually don't see myself changing these pickups out and swapping them. This is not the kind of guitar that I think of as the sort of workhorse um, or testing horse, as they say, um, that or pacing horse. I don't know. I don't know what term I'm looking for here. Um, of like the guitar on my left, I might pick that up and show it to you because I can talk a little bit about that. Uh, because that also was kind of part of the Les Paul. It's related to this guitar uh, in that way. Um, all right. So I'm going to talk about P90s a little bit. Other questions here. I'm looking. Getting a lot of hellos. Perry says, hey, by this logic, I can get that Model M I've always wanted for years. I have no doubt. Uh, 
uh, Travis Niles wants to hear the thing cranked. I think he's like asking, he's, I think he's calling bullshit on the working on Black Dog. Um, I, this is, so this is my, this is the new David Barber pedal. Uh, I'll flip it over to the J, to the blues breaker setting. It's actually at about, if I go back to this shot, uh, you can't really see it. It's only at about 10 o'clock. So that's about the amount of gain. And the thing that I was working with David on this was I wanted the gain to be lower because I, as I said, I find most dumble pedals are really over gained. Um, but... <laughs> I was laughing before the stream started that, um, yes, is absolutely like a Les Paul because it goes out soon. Turn up the copyright risk. thing that I really love about, so this is based on David's bus pedal, uh, which is a bar, um, um, stands for burn unit super sport, which is a combined pedal between a hot rotted Marshall and a Dumble style. And David had a Dumble in his shop for about a year and something. We'll do another whole stream when we release the pedal. We just got the proofs back. Um, but one of the things I really loved about it was you could hear that was breaking up really substantially, but you still get nice note definition. <laughs> It's a major seven chord, um, you know, with Gert, with dirt. Welcome, Travis. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I love it when people come in at 4.49. Hey, what's that? I do the same thing. I do that. What did I miss? Uh, Hal Nimoy says, um, what guitar is that? This is a Calling City Limits uh, with custom uh, deluxe, they call it. A deluxe with P90s pickups. Uh, it's a 20... Can't, you can't see the serial number on these. I don't know where it is. I don't know where the serial number is on a Colony guitar. It's got to be inside the case somewhere. I mean, inside the cabinet. Cabinet. Actually, the Collings are so proud of their electrical work that often on the, the, back, the back plates are clear. And you can look right in at the soldering and see the, the bumblebee caps and stuff that they use. It's really good. Um, all right. So let's talk a little bit about P90s. We got It's 450. If you want to get your questions in here. Line them up, boys and girls. Um, Bebe's giving me a P90 reference. John, JL Trim. John says, please don't exit without showing the double cut hidden in the shadows. I will pull that out. It's 450. You're right to mention it now. I'll talk a little bit about what I'm doing with that because uh, it's pretty interesting. <laughs> you don't have to apologize, Hal. We got lives, man. This is this is just YouTube. It's not life. Um, I was... I. I, I there was a moment today when I had Jeff and his um, his rock and roll uh, expert Rob on debating the list of Les Paul influences. That was fantastic. It was in the middle of a phone call testing this sound with 
John Cordy from England. And in the middle of that, I got a phone call. Uh, so this, it's been that day. Um, I think I've got the questions. Cranked up. Uh, Jim Salmon says, I never gig with my CL, but I'm sure if I do, someone will come up during the set break and say, gee, I like your playing. And I was wondering, why don't you play a real Les Paul? The person that would be asking you that Jim would be a guy named Jeff Mackerlane. So you'll recognize him when he does it. Uh, what is your favorite Journey song? Um, Don't Stop Believing. Is that the name of the song? I think that is my favorite Journey song. All right, I will do the double cut because actually it's related to this whole P90 question. So again, P90s were guitars. Uh, let's see if I can do this here. P90 pickups were designed um earlier and then they tried to have the humbuckers sound like it so uh this is a 2010 it's almost hard to see with this light today this is a 2010 prs mira um and um these these guitars came out very late in 2007 maybe even at the nam show 2008 um they had these hollow birds until the middle of 2010 um, although the very, very earliest ones had the solid birds of the late 2007s. Uh, my first really good solid body guitars in the nine, in the, in the 2000s were mirrors, PRS mirrors. I had a mirror with a wide thin neck and I much prefer a wide fat neck now. Um, and, um, so I grabbed this guitar because you can get these now for about $1,100. When I bought mine new, in 2008, it was, I think, $1,700 or $1,800. And at the time, it was the financial crisis, and they were actually giving away, you could get any set of pickups in it you wanted. And I had them put um, DGT pickups in it. So I love the hollow birds. I love the look. It's got a really nice rosewood fingerboard. Um, when David Grissom was on, I, I threw my opinion, my amateurish opinion, that the 2008 guitars and nine guitars were the best PRS, some of the best PRS years, because Paul didn't lay anybody off. He he just built fewer guitars. So they spent more time with the guitars. Excuse me. David's theory is that what they learned and then they their improved craftsmanship was yielded guitars in 2010 that sounded amazing. So this came about from a conversation I had with Ron Ellis, where he was talking to me about pickups that he was using with um, some pretty famous people including Robin Ford. And you know, my long fascination with Robin Ford's playing and his tone. And I work on my True Fire courses um, uh, on Robin's stuff all the time. Um, and Jeff's courses on Half Diminished, which is a great place to learn about the Half Diminished sort of approach that Robin uses. Um, and um, yeah, anyway, so, so I became fascinated. And all of a sudden, I found myself without a guitar to put humbucking pickups in. And I was dying to try some of Ron's pickups. So I launched this idea, if you remember the Robin Ford guitar came out and sold out like this, the signature guitars. That guitar is basically a McCarty um, with a different headstock and tweaked pickups. But we're down the street as those pickups are very similar to the um, 8515 TC TCI pickups, very similar. And I think he's gonna try a set of Ron Ellis pickups. I don't think that's a big secret. I, it's certainly not a big secret now. Anyway, so um, Ron and I really hit it off. He's an amazing guy. Uh, it's fascinating. His level of guitar nerddom um, is like you would find in a NASA scientist. What do you know? Um, and he's going to retire next month. So he's just a couple years older than me. Um, so we got this idea to put the set of pickups that are going to go in Robin's guitar in this guitar. I've always been fascinated by the fact that these, this one weighs, they weigh heavier sometimes, but this one weighs six and a half pounds. Uh, I have a Mira X in the living room that was made with basswood. They built those just in 2010, I think. And that one weighs five and a half pounds. And I've always been fascinated by EQing a lighter guitar like an SG to get closer to that, to this, to get closer to the beef, the girth that you get from a real you know, fat eight pound guitar, something with a lot more wood than this has. That's just not a lot of wood and it's beveled to boot and it's really comfortable and it's got a tummy tuck and all this kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, YouTube censorship says taking your, how many guitars do you really need? 
this is a project guitar. I'm going to claim project guitar on a few of these. And this is one of those. So the idea is for me to learn to install those parts and then learn more about EQing guitars to sound more like each other. Because I've had, long had this incredibly nerdy idea for a video where I basically talk about how many different guitars you can get tones out of by learning more about EQ. And that came from um, a rig rundown that my friend John Bollinger did with um, in the middle of it with Tom Bukovec. And Bukovec's got a 335 in his lap and he reaches down and he, EQ, he tweaks his uh, EQ7 on his board, his boss EQ7 equalizer. And he's like, all of a sudden you got a neck pickup on a Gretsch. He's like, you didn't even have to change guitars, just stepped on a pedal. And if you know about EQ, and then I'm going to add one little piece to this. If you know about that, and you know about Billy Gibbons' rig, where he uses pearly gates as a way to EQ the room, plays an open G chord, they take that image, and then they EQ all the other guitars to match that. So when Billy often just plays one guitar through a whole show with always got a boatload of guitars, so the idea of taking something like this and making it sound as much like a McCarty as I can, or as much like a Les Paul style of guitar as I can using EQ was a fascinating project for me. Will that ever yield a video? That depends. You certainly will get a video about this because one of the things I'm going to do was I have a box right there full of John Mann uh, parts. John Mann being the guy who helped design the original um, PRS Trem was the sole manufacturer of them until Paul got big enough where his lawyers were like, you can't have just one manufacturer and be exposed to that level of stuff. Uh, Dave Misham was saying Mira. Yes, this is a Mira. Um, so, uh, and Ron Ellis was raving to me about John Mann's bridge, which has adjustable thing pieces, adjustable saddles. But the real thing the difference is that this kind of just rolls over and then comes over at the top and that creates a bridge point. Ron Ellis's point was there's no real fulcrum. There's no real pushing down of the string going over something and then, you know, creating downward tension. And he thinks that has a lot to do with, he's, he's sure that has a lot to do with transferring the vibration to the body. Um, I didn't say it, but if it's not completely obvious, I'm a tone wood believer, um, or at very least a tone wood agnostic. I'm not a tone wood disbeliever. I believe in the wood of a guitar. This is an all mahogany guitar, like an ESG, um, has a pretty long uh, neck tenon. Um, it's really in there. Um, so the idea of transferring this stuff is that while we're at it, this guitar is going to go all gold. So it's going to be sort of, somebody said Lucille in my Instagram post. It's also going to be, um, I think of it more as a Black Beauty kind of thing. I, I think of like Jimmy Page's uh, Les Paul Custom. Um, you can name any number of Les Paul Customs back in the day. Um, but that's what this guitar is going to get to go through with that box full of stuff. And it's got a set of gold Ron Ellis pickups for it. And it's going to be a project that we'll share, I'll share on the channel. It might be a, a much smaller video where I just outlined that and then I'll come back down here and talk about EQing. And I, I've been using the HX Stomp to EQ um, this. And I don't know how wildly out of tune this is, but. You can hear it just doesn't have the girth. So there's all these EQs in this thing. You have a 10 band. You could have it set up where it's set up specifically for this guitar. There's a, like I've got 60 presets there. I could have it set up just to do this. Um, anyway, that's the idea. And that is my answer for my good friend, John, asking about the, the lurking black guitar in the background. All right. So how does it sound in the middle position with volumes turned down on the neck pickup? Uh, I don't know if I'd want a two knob or a four knob. Four knobs on PIF guitar is vital for me. Uh, Ryan, yeah, that's really interesting. So David Barber, uh, somebody pointed out a couple of streams ago that I tend to buy amps in twos. Okay, guilty. And he, they were joking that I tend to buy guitars in threes. Like I sold off 11 guitars and I bought three Collings. This is a pattern I never noticed about myself. And, you know, as much as I love you guys, I don't, I don't know if I need help exploring my psyche to that I'm just kidding. Um, but I bought two mirrors. I bought this one and the red one, which is going to be the Billy Gibbons guitar with eights on it, really lightweight. And, you know, the eight should move the body. And I got the new bridge and all this kind of stuff. Um, and then and then David Barber bought 
a powder blue one just like this that he found at a guitar center uh, with the hollow birds and everything. And David's uh, obviously he's a pedal builder. So he's a little bit of a tweaker when it comes to parts and um, he's got his sounding great. So he's joking that he already bought the third mirror. So we got that covered. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry, but where we're going is David, like you, wants at least three knobs. He wants to be able to balance. So we were talking to, um, he knows somebody that does custom pick guards and we were going to do or drill one of these out um, and put a third knob here you know, kind of like hammer in a straight line or slightly out of the way. Um, the Ron Ellis pickups are not going to be tapped for single coil. So that won't be, um, that won't be in the way. So we'd have room for another one. And, and this could actually be further back for me. And this is as far back as it can be. Cause when you take this off, the, the cavity is actually back here a little bit. Um, so I, I'm thinking that the, that the mirrors with three knobs, kind of like a PRS GGT would be great. It was something I always wanted when I had the mirrors before. So David pushing me, um, I'm pretty sure we're going to end up with a third knob right there, All right, even if it's a little one so that you can balance. Um, uh, I will say, Ryan, that I don't tend to do that on the Les Paul style guitars. Um, and I should. I should do I should experiment a lot more than I do. Uh, I am in the enviable position right now of having too many guitars um, that are new to me and playing those. Rob Namowitz wants to know, when was the last time I played for money? And am I in the union? Rob, the last time I played guitar for money uh, was in 2001. I had a weekly jazz gig uh, for four and a half years with the guys in a band called Miles Ahead in Binghamton, New York. We used to play at a club called The Lost Dog, and we would play function things and stuff too, but only very, very selectively, the function stuff. Um, and then I would do, when I lived in Vermont, there was really no need for another guitar player in Burlington. There's some great guitar players in Burlington. And I was really, really busy. I was the university registrar at UVM for the first two years I was there. I didn't even, I didn't even play guitar. I mean, I didn't pick it up. Um, I was really busy in that job, uh, which is one of the reasons I left in uh, 2016 uh, at the tender age of 56 years old and eventually started doing something very different like this. Um, I was never in a union. Um, and I, you know, I wasn't even aware of the union uh, at the time, to tell you the truth. I was in unions when I worked in factories when I was in college, um, though they wouldn't do much for a summer temp guy. Um, but that was that's another whole story. Uh, I actually like, uh, I was going to say this, I really like um, the monthly acoustic jam that I have. And I'm always on the lookout for a singer-songwriter that's looking for someone to sort of do the second guitar part stuff, you know, um, fills or come with like a hollow body, like my I-30 and play stuff in the background or strum along or those, I, I love doing that. And actually I've been doing a lot more singing in the, um, uh, in the acoustic group. Um, and I've always sang with my family, but, um, that's a very different thing than singing in front of people that you don't know, uh, once a month. So, um, Uh, okay, what do we got for questions as I round things out here? Randy says, I got a Gibson style Birdland guitar with dog ear P90s. Do they sound different than the Soapbox P90? Soap bar P90, yes, so that's an autofill. Uh, no, they sound exactly the same. The, the big difference is that a dog ear P90, um, because the dog ears are drilled right into the top, you can't raise and you can change, you can raise and lower the pole pieces, but you cannot raise and lower the height of the pickup. And um, the general recommendation, John Gundry in particular, was adamant that um, on a, um, I should put this down and pick up the left ball for the stream, um, on a P90 pickup, you really want to be as close to the strings as you can without having magnetic pull, you know, out of, um, pulling it out of uh, tune, that you really want those to set, they want to be close to the strings. So what you tend to see those on is arch top guitars where they are already pretty close, or you'll see that the covers are different front and back so that the, you know, that like you can see on here, they're very different and um, they're both really pretty close to the strings on this. Oh, I guess the neck is a little further away. I haven't adjusted them since I got this guitar. Uh, let's see. Dave Misham says, what year are these with that tailpiece? That tailpiece, I assume you mean on the PRS, is very similar to what you get right now. 
Uh, that really hasn't changed a lot. They have brass inserts at the bridge points on those, but again, there's no fulcrum really pushing into that bridge insert anyway. So this is all part of the long conversation. I don't think I've ever gone on the conversation uh, on the phone with Ron Ellis where we haven't delightedly talked for at least two hours. We always get going on different things. He grew up right in dirt bikes as I did, et cetera. We have a lot of things in common. Um, DC, D, DC, DC says, what is the model number of your Collings burst? Sorry, I missed it. No problem. That's a Collings. This is a Collings CL Deluxe. The Deluxe denoting, sometimes you get dots, but the trapezoids are an upgrade. Uh, uh, fret markers. Um, it gives you the ivory around the headstock. It gives you, um, and this is an upgrade as well. You can see a deluxe with dots, but you'll get neck binding. Although I've seen, I guess all the ones with binding, you really don't see non deluxe I thirties very often. You don't really see these without neck binding too. They kind of, they don't build that many guitars. I think they mostly build these pretty dressed up these days. And the tail pieces that I have are brand new from um, from John Mann. Does Collings still make the SoCal? I don't know. I was told that last year Collings built just 557 electric guitars. Now they build some of the best mandolins in the world and acoustic guitars as well. Um, I do not know how many other instruments total that they've built last year, but 557 guitars is not a lot. Uh, Rob at Legit Music and other people that carry Collings tell me that they're ordering kind of like private stock or wood library PRS that they're ordering 18 to 24 months in advance. Um, and the guitars sort of show up when they can. Um, that's right. Yeah. People are correcting the soap bar. I think that probably was not off Phil. Oh, soapbox is a joke. <laughs> I like that. Maybe we should all start calling them that. The McCarty 594s have fifties wiring. Uh, my understanding is that the, none of the PRS guitars are shipped with 50s wiring, they have trouble bleed circuits, etc. cetera. Um, Sam Stamos said, did it come with the humbuckers or are the P90s? The P90s are original to that guitar and the routes are a different size. So that's not an interchangeable thing. I could put, I could put mini humbuckers in this. I could put, um, Lawler makes a pickup that's in my offset Collings guitar that's called the pole piece, which has pole pieces like a strap pickup. And it sounds one big step towards a single coil. That guitar sounds very different than this guitar. It weighs a lot less. It has a very flamey maple neck, et cetera, that may be a different strain, different day, um, but very, very different. Um, <laughs> Christopher Butler can't help himself saying again that the top is sick. Yeah, the top is kind of crazy. Uh, you know, it, and actually the thumbnail really captures it more than this. And in natural light, these are, you know, my overhead uh, soap, um, soft boxes, but uh, in natural light, it's really crazy. Uh, Leland Berg is answering us. PRS 594s have unique wirings. Well, you got, you know, you got, um, push pull and all that kind of stuff. This guitar doesn't have any of that. This is very much like a 59. Okay. Uh, well, we're a little over today. Uh, I appreciate everybody being here. I want to thank Bebe for being here. I didn't bring him up on the pick. That's my buddy Bebe. Um, and, uh, thank him for being here. And as always coming up with the answers when, uh, I fumble and don't remember them in the heat of the moment. And um, I want to remind everybody that today's stream was from the Friends of 5 Watt. If you can, go ahead and sign up for Friends of 5 Watt. You can find it on um, just 5 Um uh, It has links to the store and it has links to Patreon. And um, and they're there. And the links are in the, uh, just in the chat. I want to thank everybody that got here today. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I'm going to put uh, that uh, slide up again. And uh, thanks again. And I will see everybody soon. Um, as I said, the next video coming out will be the Les Pauls that changed the world. All right. And we didn't have time today, but um, then you can all start burning me an effigy about my 10 choices because I'm sure all of us, and I'll say all this at the beginning of the video, I'm sure all of us would have a completely different list, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's fun to do it. And I think, frankly, it's an interesting a uh, bit of history for me in particular, given how much I've written about history and, and built in the videos to kind of say, okay, well, which of these artists made the biggest difference? Okay. Thanks again. And until next time, thanks for being a part of the five art world.